Paul, it is diecast number 370. I wanted to pick an amusing name, like I like to pick names for these episodes to go with the number, but I can't think of anything that is represented by 370. Hmm, it's not prime, that's for sure. Right, like 360 is like a trick, like a no scope. There's that. There, there are all kinds of interesting numbers, but 370 stands out as being remarkably uninteresting. It's but the bland cast are. this week, huh? Oh, there's the there's the episode title. So I see um, that you played Endless Space this week. So did I. Uh, the endless the endless series. I didn't even realize that they that it was all the same. That it's all like the a titles sub -genre. were related. Yeah. Right, of the Dungeon of the Endless, Endless Space, Endless Clicking. I don't know what all the titles are, but they, they have the word <laughs> Endless in the title. And I got Endless Space, and I played it for 10 minutes. Hmm. And I am curious what you thought of it. Well, uh, I picked up Endless Space and Endless Space 2 on the, whatever, the New Year's, Chinese Lunar New Year sale or whatever it was. Um, and so I, I played a little bit of Endless Space, the original, uh, and it didn't like being on Linux very well. And so then I decided, well, I'll just, you know, play Endless Space 2. So Endless Space and Endless Space 2 feel uh, very much in the same vein as Master of Orion and Master of Orion 2, the original, you know, 4X space games from the, what was that, the 90s. Too much so, really, for me. That was my problem. It was not just like the same genre, like, you know, Warcraft and Starcraft are the same genre and have many of the same conventions, but they're not like one to one. They have a slightly different rhythm to them and a different feel. Mm. But like en Endless Space, I felt like it was a game I'd already played before, but with like a different UI. Like, yeah. What if like, okay, first turn, colony ship, choose research. Yep, move to the closest star system. There's a place to colonize. Yep, put it there. Do the most obvious thing. Start building the one most obvious thing. Start doing the most obvious research. And, you know, I'm like, this is the first 10 turns of every one of those games. And that's not bad. It doesn't mean the game doesn't have a reason to exist. I was just like, you know, what's the hook, guys? You made this game for a reason. Mm. What is it you wanted your game to do that wasn't already being done? You know, I want Master of Orion, except, and then you've got your twist or your extra thing or your new feature. Oh, except we're going to have awesome AI or, you know really good multiplayer or big titty anime girls, whatever the thing is that you think those other ga <laughs> games need, you put it in this one. But I didn't see. Anime aliens. Yeah. I didn't stick along, stick around long enough to see the tits, maybe. I don't know, but I didn't see. I, it, I'm sure it, there must be a mod for it. But the Endless <laughs> series, uh, since you're not familiar with it, the Endless series is, is kind of focused on its hero-led like heroes and quests so it's kind of like halfway between a 4x and like a um not a king's quest what is that called uh the heroes of might and magic a heroes of might and magic game right where heroes of might and magic is all about like your heroes and they're going around and you're like getting you're doing all these quests and conquering stuff and then like the 4x games are very focused on just the large scale economic kind of stuff and uh, so the endless games are trying to kind of combine those two flavors into that's that's the whole endless thing is their their jam hmm. i didn't see any of that in the beginning of the game again that's not necessarily that doesn't mean the game is terrible it just means i i didn't feel any compulsion to play it uh, I yeah was looking yeah for a hook. i yeah i had exactly the same um the same response when i i played it so i, I played endless space and then i, I boot up endless space 2 and that one also did not like linux very well um, it wouldn't load any of the videos for whatever reason. So like anytime there was a video, it was just like that that test pattern thing you used to see on television back when there was, you know, television oh, wow. broadcast. And and then uh, after I played for about five minutes, it, it crashed with a saying like too many threads or whatever. So, but I bit the bullet and 
and went downstairs and got on my Windows computer, one of my Windows computers, and played about three hours of Endless Space this afternoon. So Okay, and, there's uh, an endorsement. I, I got a little bit of ways into it so that I could, well, so I could have something to talk about on the show, <laughs> but... I played three hours. I got a little ways into it. Yeah, well, you know how these Forex games go, right? You get yeah, started, and yeah. like you said, the first 10 turns, are like, you don't make any decisions, and then, like, the next 20 turns are all about, like, dealing with the fact that you didn't have a plan for the first 10 turns, and then after that, it's right. just, like, getting beaten down by alien fleets and armadas nonstop till you die. Right. Not really, but... So, so um, yeah, it's, it's hero-focused. There's, like, a whole quest line for, like, finding the Academy of Heroes, which is kind of a weird thing, like... A lot of these games are very soft sci-fi. They're not really trying to go into like leaning into the hard tech sci-fi stuff. It's it's a flavor that they're adding to you know this underlying game mechanic system. Yeah. And I can really see how that's happening with like this feels in many ways like it was grown out of and probably it was grown out of uh, like a medieval fantasy thing where it's like okay well these heroes all train in like Paris or whatever fantasy Paris. And, you know, they get all their education and then they go out and they're like these rulers and kings of all these different countries and things. So, and then you're trying to like court the different heroes and like get better heroes and level yours up and stuff like that. Um, but this is like an inner galactic or like intragalactic, I suppose. It's just one galaxy, but like this huge, huge, huge star map and, uh, you know, light years of distance or whatever. And your ships don't like, your ships don't go that fast. And so there's like this, this mysterious academy where all of the heroes in the galaxy are trained and so like first off like you can't become a hero unless you go to the academy it's like there's some sort of intergalactic accreditation board or something you need a certificate you gotta join the hero union yeah and it's supposed to be also there's like dust is the the galactic currency but it's also what you use to like infuse heroes and give them special powers so it, that's a little bit weird too because like is are these like is this like Dune, where like the spice must flow so that everything works, or like, how does uh, I don't understand? And then like the heroes, like you've got a hero on your staff at the beginning of the game, so like he's there, and you're using her or her is is on your you know your board, and you can use them to you put them on a ship and they fly around. You can put them on one of your planets and they give the planet bonuses, but you don't know where the academy is. And it's like, can you not just talk to this person? Have they like had a mind wipe? <laughs> What's going on? So, uh, Hero, where'd you go to school? How did you get there, given that we haven't made the technology for making this journey yet? Uh -huh. And there's only yeah, one yeah, in the exactly. galaxy. And, uh -huh. that's, and so that creates a balance problem for the map. Like, some people are going to be close to this place, and some people aren't. Well, it's in the center of the galaxy, and, like, you all start around the edge of the galaxy. So it's, it's kind of, you know, it's predictably kind of balanced uh, oh, and there's a bonus for the person to, like, who gets there first we need to spend centuries developing our empire so that we can finally reach the planet and put a flag on the planet where all of our personnel are trained <laughs> we can finally go to school oh boy i've been waiting for this day so I, that's, a that's a little strange little weird. uh yeah I, so i don't i don't know exactly what they're trying to go for there but it's a little strange. It's a super secret galactic I, academy that everyone goes to that's a hero. No, it's, okay. I do like the idea of hero. I used to love that in Master of Orion, how you'd get governors mm, and ship mm -hmm. captains. Mm -hmm. And like, oh, this governor's good with food. And this one's good at repelling invasions. And this one is, you know, right. I don't know. Go yeah. Same idea. Same idea. Bonus science or whatever. And you're like, okay, I could either use... Um, you know, Dr. Big Brain here to boost the science of my science planet and make tons more science, or I could use them to even up my weak planet. And that's an interesting choice. Like, yeah, do you put the industrialist on, on the to frontier do. to help him develop it into a better world, or do you put him on your main planet and just like pump out battleships every turn? Right, right. There's a lot of interesting choices to make there. So I, I actually like that. Just the idea that there's a single school is a little weird. Yeah, it is a little strange. In uh, in this variety of the hero thing, the heroes have levels and level up. So I'm like, I, I don't remember in Master of Orion 2 if the heroes leveled up or not, or the governors. I don't remember either. 
and I think they were separate. The like the commanders of the, like the ship commanders and the governors were were separate things. Yeah, they were separate. So they, yeah. they weren't cross. Yeah. So in this one, they're cross compatible. You can have them do either way. And they're special talents that you get when you level up, and you can kind of specialize into one or the other. But so anyways, it's cool. And um, there's a bunch of quests that that show up in your thing. So you're flying around your scout ship, and you discover this alien world, and it's got a lost uh, what is it, the progenitors of all the technology and stuff in the galaxy are called the endless of course Th these things always have the progenitors there's always yeah you're never the first one out there there's always somebody yeah that's, they, that's kind they, of a, they a filled, bummer right every every space already has ruins and i think it's because ruins are great they're mysterious like if there was no alien technology out there then space is just a bunch of rocks, right? I mean, we want that sense of mystery and some other intelligence has been here before. But then mm. if you want that, then you have to explain, you know, okay, there was an intelligence here. Okay, well, why are they not running things? Why didn't they come into space and find the Q continuum already running things and, you know, <laughs> right, and right. fully colonized every square inch of every rock of every star <laughs> i think in this world i don't know if this is the same for each playthrough but in my playthrough uh right now my first playthrough it says that there was like the dust wars and like the endless died off or something because of this giant war over this mystical fantasy drug currency thing right right anyway, it's always it's... a big war or yeah. or machines the the evil machines from oh yeah the machine uprising or, right Cleanse or they transcended them. to another plane of existence and left behind all their technology or the the writer got bored and decided to make them all dead so uh, another weird thing in this is there are like seven or six or seven strategic resources they're like these like super powerful resources that you have to gain access to in order to do high level tech stuff and build the best weapons and advances and stuff um and they're all like made up stuff you know solarium and and you know or a chalcum crystals and you know all that kind of thing except that the, the, the very crystals. first one yeah yeah. yeah yeah exactly except that, well solarium in this one it's like deuterium and i don't know i don't know it's all made up except for titanium like the first strategic resources galactic strategic resources titanium it's like guys do you not realize that titanium is a real thing like we use titanium in real life right right like you you have to keep that separate like you know your weird orcish stuff that that doesn't exist but elements like titanium and al and um uranium and unobtainium those are all real <laughs> right yeah exactly uh trilithium um so so like titanium is there and then also like there's always this weird thing in these games about science right like you have to get science somehow and you can do it one of two ways you can either have it just like it's just based on the stuff that you build but then it's not really a strategic choice right like it doesn't matter what planet you put your science stuff on you just put your science on like the planet that's not good for anything else um, right exactly that's just that's or, just uh, that's just what the scientists need is a place where they can do science without somebody trying to farm next to them <laughs> just oh you're can, we, can you stop farming so loud i can't concentrate right. on my science you can get a bonus for like all population that's not on science right like if there's no other population on the planet then you get this big bonus and just leave me alone let me concentrate um, so the other way to do it, of course, is to have some planets give you a bonus to science. But then it's this weird thing where it's like science is this natural resource that you can, like, dig out of the ground. Or, like, like it, it's kind of a strange thing, as if, like, the right. laws of the universe don't apply in the same way in all places, right? Like, there's some places that have the laws of nature are easier to observe in some way. I don't know. It's, it's a very strange, <laughs> right. very strange thing. It? What is it about standing on the surface of this world that makes it easier for you to ponder the behavior of atoms? Right, or do experiments or something. And I guess if there's some sort of natural phenomena that you're trying to learn from, uh, Right, fine. but then you study it, and then you learn everything about it, you know? Yeah. 
We're, right. And now you've done the science and, and now what? Like it's still giving you a bonus for some reason? Like, you know, um, who was it that invented penicillin? Um, oh, I don't remember. Discovered, though. Pastor? Discovered it, penicillin. Yeah, yeah, not invented. But, you know, that guy discovered penicillin. But we're not still studying that Petri dish of mold. We've moved on. Yeah. Right. He was like, oh, okay, good. Good to know. Let's tell everyone about that. And uh, and now, now what? Bread mold? Can we, now can we just continue, keep on? Now we continue, just continue studying the ever-loving crap out of that Petri dish. And we're going to cure <laughs> cancer and invent biomechanics and robot arms. Just keep studying the <laughs> right, Petri right. dish as That's hard the crazy as thing, can. right? It's like, okay, we've got a Petri dish and it's got this fascinating alien chemical in it. And it's going to make us super great at political science for some reason. Right. Uh, so, so that's weird. Um, you can't build tanks and airplanes until you have like this advanced technology. And it's like, guys, do you not realize that we have airplanes and tanks right now? Like, I've I've worked on those things myself. Like, this isn't some sort of alien technology where you can have airplanes and tanks. So there's some some strange flavor stuff going on. But um, but on the whole, I've been having a good time. So, yeah, endless space too. I only got endless space because it was like. Like some ridiculous, yeah, it was so cheap. And then, and you never know when you're going to, when the bug's going to bite and you're going to need to play one of these games. So you yeah, just, you know, yeah. for a dollar fifty, you put it in your stash. Yeah, fair enough. I, I'm not sure, I, I didn't play Endless Space, the original, enough to know the difference between the two. Um, but it, I mean, the, the graphics are certainly much better on, on the second version. And it's got really cool, whenever you look at a new star system, it zooms in and gives you like this little cinematic thing of like each planet and it's a readout. And you can skip it if you want, but it's really neat. It'd be like, you know, oh, here's this planet and here's what it does. And here's like all the anomalies on it. And here's this planet and it's got the lens flare and it looks nice. And when you colonize a planet, it's got like a, a little panorama of, you know, like two and a half D thing where it's got the animated, you know, different sprites and stuff. And then your colony ship lands, and it's like, oh, this is, you know, this is very tasteful. It's, it's well done. Well, it's funny that you are colonizing space in spaceships this week. This week, I was building spaceships in Blender. <gasps> Ooh, do tell. Um, This week, there was, I saw an episode of Corridor Crew. I don't know if you've ever seen that on YouTube. Mm-mm. Corridor crew are special effects artists, um, and they look at special effects in movies, and they, they're a successful enough YouTube channel that's, that, that they get celebrity guests. And this week, one of their celebrity guests was Adam Savage. Uh -huh. And a Adam Savage was talking about how he worked on, he worked on a lot of stuff I didn't realize. Um, like I knew he'd worked on the prequel movies, but there was a lot of additional stuff like back in the nineties. I'm like, really? You were doing this stuff back in the nineties? He told a story like he built this analog of the space shuttle for some Clint Eastwood movie called Space Cowboys, which I've never seen. But hmm. you know, uh, in space travel, there's a lot of stuff covered in gold foil. Yeah. And, Windows um, and stuff for radiation shielding. Right. And he talked about, well, they're building a miniature, a 112 scale miniature. And they were like, what do we use for gold foil? Because we're not going to use real gold foil. <laughs> um, so what do we use? And after experimenting <laughs> with all these different things, they found the perfect um, material was Rolos, was this candy called Rolos. And they came in, it's like this tube of little chewy chocolate things but they come in a gold wrapper and so they had somebody buy cases of this candy open them all and just stack up all the wrappers to to make this space shuttle that that was really great oh man but there are pictures of adam savage working on these models that are i mean you you know a model that's like as big as a human it's supposed to be the size of a building but you, you know yeah yeah like a whole desktop it's, kind of model. Right. But it is freaking huge. And he talked about how, you know, well, how do you do, you got to put greebles on this, right? You have to put stuff on the surface to hint <laughs> at surface detail or else the eye will just think, oh, 
that's a very tiny model. <laughs> Your mm -hmm. eye won't be fooled. Yeah. But if you have lots and lots of detail and pipes and windows and other things that your eye assumes are human scale, then it'll assume this thing is big. But to, for that to work, yeah. you need lots of it. Handholds and you... labels and access panels and yeah. all kinds of stuff. But how do you decide how, you know, how do you decide what to put it on? And you can't just make it random. You can't just like stick crap to it with complete chaos. Um, it ends up looking dumb and fake. And this is something I've run into in the past when I've tried to make space stuff and I realized, oh, you need greebles for scale. I did know that. But, like, nothing I ever made really felt right. And it's just like, well, I'll add more of these blocky things. What are they? I don't know. Air conditioners or some shit. <laughs> just more air conditioning more hvac blocks on the outside of this spaceship i don't know what they are whatever yeah and what adam savage was talking about when he built these models is that he would come up he said it really helps to have a story for the things you're doing now you know that doesn't mean he came up with characters that had a store okay this panel was it was installed by zoop gunray <laughs> you know right right before he went off to the academy no he would just like okay this panel something got blown off in a battle and they had to cover the hole with this panel that's why it's a different color and since that's the case, I'll have to route this surface pipe or cable around that since it was added later. Like, you sort of organically build it the way they would organically build it. Yeah, Cutting as corners. if it's not pristine and, like, they did it right the first try, but, like, it has some history yeah. to it. Right, exactly. C creating things with history so that it's not just randomness. And it helps to have a story for each thing you put on there and i thought that's a really interesting thing to do i wonder if that would help me because i i've always wanted to make a good i've made i've made hundreds of spaceships in my career and i've never made one that i was happy with yeah they are very it's a very difficult line to walk right and i thought well you know i'll take another swing at that and i'll try that approach of like having a story for each thing I add to the spaceship. And then I got completely, like, I couldn't even get to the point where I was working on that. You know, I want to come up with an outline and then begin adding details to the surface. But instead, um, I, like, get sidetracked coming up with textures. And I spent, like, two days obsessing over all the different ways you can make metal panels. How big oh, should man. they be? How big should the panels be compared to windows? Like, should these panels be about windows sized? Or should they, you know, be like house sized? And should they have giant, like, rivets the size of your fist? Or should the rivets be invisible? Or should they just have, like, screws in the corners? How should they have seams together? Should they overlap? How much should they stick out from the surface? How, you know... How how much color differentiation should there be between the panels? And I got mm. completely lost on these details for several days. Just not really making progress, just running endless experiments trying to... And really, this is stuff that if I'd entered 3D modeling properly, instead of sort of entering it sideways and figuring it out as I went, this is stuff I would have figured out in the beginning of my career back in the 90s uh i don't i don't think so because a lot of this stuff that you're talking about doesn't have a right answer there is no right answer to how much contrast there is or, or what kind of fasteners you use or whatever what you really need is a design bible right yeah i understand that there's no right answer but i can assure you that there are wrong answers yeah, okay, okay, fair enough. But I mean, you'd spend a lot of time at the beginning of a project establishing the style first before you even start on, you know, making any particular thing, right? You'd figure out, you know, what's the look and what's the technology and all that right. stuff. And, yeah. Right. Um, But for me, I was like sort of doing things the way I used to do back in the day when I was 
when I modeled for a mm. living. Mm. And then, like, sit back and think of it. It's nice now that I'm not making this for anyone and it's not going to be judged by a boss. And I can just ponder it and I can... I can say, I'm not sure why I'm unhappy with this. And I can just put it on the back shelf, go back, edit some posts, catch up on my website, write an article, and then come back to it. Where if I did that at Active Worlds, my boss comes in, hey, did you finish that model? Yeah, I wasn't happy with it, so I stopped working on it. <laughs> yeah, then, you know, it's, it's due like, in like four hours. Are you going to have it done yeah. by then? No, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, yeah, it's really nice to just be able to put something on the back burner, sleep on it. And mm -hmm. so I sort of began learning a bunch of stuff not to do that, you know, just cleaning up all my bad habits from the 90s. Now, some of them I've cleaned up just by having better tools. The UV mapping tools in Blender are just so much better than what I had to work with in the 90s. UV oh, mapping yeah. in the 90s was just a living nightmare. It was so bad. It was so bad. Um, so I, I'm, I'm happy with uh, what I'm doing. And I learned a lot, even though I have absolutely no use for this knowledge and no goal. And I'm not, you know, it's not like I'll finally be able to make those spaceships for a video game. It's like I have no plan. But it just feels really good to go back and revisit these old skills and use them and get better at them. Oh man! So you're gonna make a like an article series on Seamus's learning to make Blender spaceships thing or or what? I that would be, you know, it didn't occur to me that this would be uh, worthy of an article because it was supposed to be I was gonna fiddle around with this for a few hours and then I ended up spent and I didn't even get to. I still haven't done the thing that Adam Savage talked about. I still have not re yeah. I still have not reached the beginning of the project where I would begin um making this. I don't know, we'll see. Uh people shout at me in the comments if you want to see more about this sort of thing and I will consider I would love writing about for it. For one, that would be fantastic. That would be so cool. Hopefully I can at least get to the start of the project. That's my that's my goal now. <laughs> I is know, to get right? to the part where I get, I mean, this is hard for me to come up with just the outline of a ship that does not look terrible. We take it for granted, the the structure, the overall structure of a spaceship is not an easy thing. There are infinitely many of them that look really dumb and boring, and <laughs> it's not Especially clear Especially if you start with the default them. cube. Right. <laughs> Right. It's like, what is it that about this that isn't working? What, what mm. is it? Is it, why wasn't there, does this um, look stupid? It wasn't there a, like a tool that someone made that like randomly generates spaceships? I, or, I mean, it seems like there must be several, but. Right. Didn't you make one? You well, I, I wrote code. some articles for your, your website where I was trying to do that. And I never got to the point where I started to actually have it procedurally generate them. But you could start with one of those, I suppose. Yeah, I don't know. I I kind of don't want to use... A, I suppose that would be the correct thing, is to use somebody else's ship. Like, have a ship with no detail, just the outline. Just like a naked hull. Mm. Um, just a frame. And then, okay, go in and add detail on this to make it look big. And make it look detailed enough that you could put the camera in close that you could yeah. do a close pan on it as opposed to just seeing it you know scream by right right in the middle of a dog fight um that, that's well, an interesting yeah. exercise yeah yeah there's there's a lot of there's a lot of ways to do it and and like i said the first thing really is to, if you want to make it look good you have to know what good means in the context of like your project so i mean i would recommend the first thing is just to like go on the internet and look up some spaceship ideas and like get a, a one or two screenshots of like this is the style i'm going for right don't copy the, the details and the exact stuff right. but just like this is the the kind of spaceship that i'm thinking of making and uh, that'll help you a lot with getting over those initial steps of like you know all the what is what does all of this mean and, you know have to the proportions and all that yeah well speaking of generating objects 
on 3D models, uh, I and my kids have been having a whale of a time with Hero Forge in the past uh, week or so. What is Hero Forge? I'm glad you asked. If you go to HeroForge.com, I'm not sponsored by nor am I any part of this project, but if you go to HeroForge.com, it's a um, miniature building site. It's a character. They, they help you design and build a character miniature, and then you can buy a 3D print or a 3D model of that character from them. So the website and the designs and all of that stuff is free, and then you pay when you want to download the, the model itself. Wait, you download the model? Or you buy a 3D print from them. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I was like, wait, they're going to sell you <laughs> the output of their avatar generator? I see, I see. Right, well, yeah, they, you can buy the 3D model, like uh, the 3D printed model, if you want. Or you can also just buy, like, the, the output of their character generator, the STL file, which is a non-textured model, or the uh, Unity uh, object which then you can put into Tabletop Simulator or you can import into Blender or whatever. Huh. And so you're having fun with this? Yeah, it's... So back in the day, uh, maybe like, I forget how long ago Hero Forge started, but back in the day, they didn't have any textures. It was just 3D models. And their their suite of character poses and, and accessories and things was fairly limited. So I played around with it back in the day a little bit, um, but never was particularly entranced with it. It was like, yeah, okay, this is this is really neat for someone who needs like a miniature and uh, and kind of let it go with that. And so people would come to me over the years and like saying, hey, can you do this character model for me? My budget is like 50 bucks. And I was like, I can't do it for 50 bucks. But if you want to go to heroforge.com, you can do it yourself and it's only going to cost you eight bucks or whatever. And uh, right. so I've been sending him traffic, you know, over the years. And uh, recently, someone asked me again and like okay well yeah you should go to hero forge and then i was like you know i i should probably go and see like what their tools are like now are they even still online like you know you just lose track of these things so uh i went over there and they've added a ton of different character models a ton of different races a ton of different costumes a ton of different accessories um they've got really nice search tools and they've got colors so you can color everything and they've got preset colored you know themes so you can just like you know pick one out um and then the the thing that we've been uh, enjoying, or at least I have, and I've I've been imposing upon my children, I suppose, is that uh, you can share models. And when you, so you click the share button, and it creates a little link. And at the end of the link, there is a little number that tells it like what the what the share thing is. And normally these things are UUID, right? It's a non-serialized huge long number that's just like a hash of whatever the the settings right. are or something. But in HeroForge, it is a serialized number. It's just a number, and it increments by one every time you you share a model, any anytime anyone shares a model. So you can put any number in there that's you know up to the current one, and uh, right. view whatever model that anyone else has shared. And so I wrote a little Blender or a little Python script to automatically select a random number and bring up the web page. And uh, so I you know the kids are like, I want a new one. You push enter on the Python script and it's like, boop, here's a, you know, random thing that somebody made. And uh, it's been really fun. Huh. That is, that is, I'm, I'm playing with it now while we're talking. Yeah. Uh, but of course, if you order one of these, then you got to paint it yourself. You can order it in colored printed plastic and it'll come pre-colored. Man, technology has come so far. Yeah. I mean, it's not cheap. It's like, 50 60 bucks or whatever for you know a little mini but oh hey you don't have to spend three hours painting it right although for some people that's half the fun yeah it's true it's true if your hobby is is painting minis then you can buy it with no color or you can download the stl and then like make a whole bunch of variations yourself and you know rig it up they don't send you a rigged model so that's i'd really love to have an option to like get a fully rigged model with all the hooks on it you know or like download multiple different uh accessories or whatever you know and you get access to their api right because it's it's a lovely right. it's a lovely tool they've got all the ambient occlusion baked in and it's really neat i i thought it was a, a really neat tool but uh they don't offer that at least not to the public a shame yeah so you can't use this to like make characters for your video game well you could i mean you could make the but it's thing, not the character 
Uh, it's not rigged, but I mean, rigging isn't hard if you know how to do it. I guess that's the, <laughs> if you know how to do rigging, it's easy. But well, uh, yeah, yeah, if you've got a guy who's already doing rigging, right, who's someone who's able to make character models, and it would be fairly inexpensive to start with one of these models and then you know export it, rig it, modify the stuff to yeah. match your game or whatever. I imagine there's got to be a way to buy that access from them, but I I have not looked into it or know what it is, but. Uh, yeah, that would be really cool if you could just like import the Hero Forge system into your game so that that's your character creator in your game. Right. I imagine they must have thought of that as well. I mean, it's in Unity format, so maybe there's already integration on Unity. Right. Well, it's certainly, I'm sure it's written in Unity, so. Oh, right. I didn't think of that. Yeah, it probably is written in Unity. Yeah. So you're halfway there. Just, just send me the C sharp right? files. It'll Drop be it in fine. my project. It just works. <laughs> and it, so it brought to mind like the 50 gigabyte Fortnite download that we were talking about back in Diecast 272, um, where it's just like there's all these cosmetics and there's no way to get them to you unless we send you all the data and each one is a separate thing. It's like, no, it isn't. Like, that's right. not true at all. Hero Forge is doing this on it's like in your browser, right? That's not 50 gigs. It's probably like less than one gig. Right, although if you want to do them at a really high level of detail and you want to keep... And if they're all bespoke creations, you know, you don't... Spider-Man, the Spider-Man skin isn't made by using their avatar creator to put parts together. They they told their artist, hey, make us a Spider-Man because it's licensed and everybody's really particular about the exact proportions and how it all looks and... It won't quite work with the with our base model. Yeah, I, I'm not buying that though. You could do like 99% of a custom model of Spider-Man just with a nude with like a you know a, a blank face, right? And just put a texture on it. You modify the modify the proportions with the with the um with the armature, right? You just take the bones and like scale them to the right size if you need specific proportions, and like you'd be done. In fact, that's what they did in City of Heroes, didn't they? Like their character creator was basically just a texturing right. thing with a few little accessories that they had stamped on. You could do that, but that's obviously not their workflow. They didn't want to be limited. Like they didn't want to, you know, somebody comes and yeah. says, "Hey, yeah, true. Here's here's we're going to give you the license to do a model of three arm guy, and you can put him <laughs> in your game and sell him for thirty bucks." And they'd be like, "Oh, but we don't. Our tools don't do three arm guy." I'm like. Pfft. Everybody gets their own bespoke model. You know, you know who does do three arms? Pipeline. Who's Hero that? Forge does three arms. It's got You're an option kidding. for extra arms. No, I'm not kidding. It's incredible. It's so it's so powerful. They've got wings and they've got mounts. You can put them on a a wolf, and it's it's cool. And we've been having a, a ball of a time. Very cool. Another thing that's fun, although uh, I have not played it recently, is Valheim. And uh, Penny Arcade did a comic which I just I shared with my wife and my kids. It was just it was just so spot on, where um, where Gabe goes to his son and he's like, oh, I I died. It's all in this flowery language. It's lovely. I died, you know, over across the ocean. I need your help. And his son's like, oh well, what are you gonna do for me? And he's like, I'll unload the dishes for you after dinner. <laughs> it's just like, yep, yep, <laughs> right. that's how that works. Right. <laughs> I love this. I love this bargaining. And it is sort of like the, the parent going to their kids for help. I do this once in a while with Isaac. I'll get stuck on a game and rather than open up the wiki, if I don't know what I'm looking for, like, oh, uh, I'm trying to do this thing in Risk of Rain and I don't know how to do it and I don't know what it's called, so I don't know what to search for in the wiki. I'll just go yeah. and like, Isaac, tell me where to find that thing. How, how do I do that thing? And just use him. Yeah, as a you know human the big wiki. orange building. It's got like the shiny, spinny thing on top. What is that for? Why? Why do they keep putting it on my level? So, this wasn't a problem when I was a kid. My mom never came to me and like, oh, can you help me with asteroids? <laughs> can you explain to me how do you find the secret level in Pong? I, I, I need can't you beat to, the boss. I need you to break grind out. my. I need you to grind my character in World of Warcraft. I need you know epic gear for it. Can you? I need you to do that instead of your homework. Right. So this is a this is a first, I guess for, I guess uh, Gen X is the first generation that played video games that 
than, you know, the first generation of video gaming parents. Hmm. Boomer. Yeah, probably. Boomers aren't boomer. I mean, you know, you can occasionally find a boomer that plays games, but, you know, it's pretty rare. Yeah, yeah. My parents are, my dad's on the older end and my mom's on the younger end of boomers and, and neither of them are, are interested in video games at all. I mean, they're, they're like, okay, you know, it's fine, but it's, it's not a pastime that they're going to engage in. That seems so weird to me. I'm like, how could you not love video games? How could you not think this is the greatest thing ever? But then if people are into TikTok and I spent about 10 minutes on TikTok to see what the fuss was about. And that was the most irritating shit I've seen ever ever oh my gosh why is this popular <laughs> well, just rub sandpaper all over your eyes it's everybody's doing it Seamus <laughs> I can't even imagine a theoretical like a hypothetical version of this that would be good like in a fictional world you could make up a version of something like TikTok that isn't doesn't have all the horrible flaws of TikTok, and it would still suck. What what is it? <laughs> what is the good thing in here? If what am I supposed to be getting out of this? And I realize I sound like the oldest man ever ranting at the new hip new thing the kids are into. I I totally I I embrace that. I own it. Yes, I am a crusty old man, and it's a weird thing to just like you know realize <laughs> you've hit that part in your life i was on the cutting edge i was like i was making web pages when most of the people i knew didn't hadn't heard the word internet yet i was on the bleeding edge and now i'm looking at tiktok going what is this bullshit well i mean you've also never been an extrovert so i think tiktok really is True. laser targeted for people who want to know what other people are up to and want to be involved in other people's stuff it's friend it does yeah, I don't want to insult people that like TikTok, but it's almost like, to me, it, it feels like children shouting. Everything is so loud and so intense, and everybody's having such big emotions all the time. It does feel, yeah, like... Playground dynamics. Right, like, there's that hallway in the, the Matrix sequel... It's like that infinite white hallway of doors. Like, imagine going down that hallway and you open a door and it's filled with screaming children who all want to tell you about the thing they just did. And there's three of them shouting at you at once. And you're like, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You shut the door. Open up the next one. And there's six kids, all of them, want you to look at their drawing first. <laughs> and you slam that door. And you go next door and there's, you open it and there's nine kids in there having a fight over who gets these cupcakes. And who's supposed to, who does it, is it supposed to be getting a cupcake? And who is supposed to get an extra cupcake? Because they were good. And you slam that door and you're like, I don't want to open any more doors. I just want to stay <laughs> here in my white There's a three-ring circus. And there's like right? a, a whole carnival show in one of them. Open the door and there's like seven kids that all have to go to the bathroom right now. Well, you know, there's there's people, there's communities of people that do things together, flower arranging and and book clubs and who knows what, right? Fantasy concept yeah. artists and all kinds of things. It's just yeah, you keep stumbling into these um, very intense dialogues between like TikTok has no idea what I like, so it just sort of throws me into the middle of yeah. some social chaos. Oh, no yeah, idea yeah. of who these people are, or what their problem is, or why they're angry, or what they're upset about, or what they're excited about, or what is this, what are they, I don't even know what you're saying, why are you wearing that, and what does any of this mean, and never mind, I'm shutting this door, I'm going back to the white void. <laughs> yeah, I have a, a similar um, entertaining situation when I go into YouTube on private, you know, incognito mode or whatever, and you go on to, there, and the front page is like, I guess you're a generic person. Here's some sports and politics, and there's a, a, a <laughs> comedy show. And you know, what do you want to tell us something about yourself? And it's just like I don't want to tell you about myself. Go away, leave me alone. I'm just here to find right. a tutorial on how to do this weird esoteric thing in Blender or whatever. I guess that's a weird thing. Like in you on YouTube, you're shown a whole bunch of thumbnails, and you choose one. On TikTok, it's just like there's no choice it's not like here's a menu of things you might it's like we're gonna start a video let us know if you're into it 
<laughs> it's just, just face first into the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. It's like uh, what uh, Mr. Universe and, you know, just all the screens and they're all showing something completely yes. different. Yes. Just the endless chaos. And it's like maybe if he's stuck with it long enough, you find that. And of course, it's very weird because I obviously, obviously, TikTok is designed to be used on phones, but I barely use my phone. So mm, it really right. like even if I liked it culturally and even if it contained the information that was useful for, to to me. It doesn't come in a format that's useful to me because like my phone sits on my desk for days at a time without being picked up and I sit at my desktop computer and once in a while my wife will send me like through Google chat she'll send me a TikTok link and I just see the link pop up in Google chat and I click on it and it opens on my desktop computer <laughs> it's just uh -huh. the weirdest the weirdest thing in the world to run TikTok on a desktop computer yeah, I I don't know I don't know what or who that is for either. I I have not have not ventured into TikTok at all. But uh you just I think you just need to find a site that does, you know, spaceship concept designs. I'm sure there's somewhere right. in there. The spaceship concept board section of TikTok. <laughs> spaceship. Uh, yeah, I I never see anything like that. It's always drama and politics and I mean, that, that link on Twitter, that's what rises to the top of the algorithm, is emotional conflict between people. What makes people angry? Oh, here we're, mm. here we're talking about this thing that gets everybody worked up. Well, that gets all the attention, so that's what everything is all about all the time, everywhere all the time. No, thank you. Let's do some mailbags. Right. Yeah. Oh, this is a long one. Okay, this starts off ominously. This five-paragraph email, quite long, and starts off, Dear DieCast, I am not sure how to exactly explain this. Now, as a start to an email, that's, that's a rough start. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what I want to say, but I'm just going to start typing, and I'll let you work it out on your end. I think my answer to this email, uh, without reading it on the air, is spore. That's like... That's the one that comes immediately to mind. Okay, so we're looking for the the idea of this is the thrust of this is a game built around a big idea that flopped. Um, yeah, Spore. There was I can't remember it now. I've always been sort of fascinated with it, even though I never wanted to play it. It was an augmented reality MMO about unraveling a conspiracy, hmm. and you played this game like you gave them your phone number and people would leave you vo like characters in the game would leave you voicemail messages telling you to go to a website and you would go there so it, it felt like you were investigating a conspiracy that's what this was it was recreating mm. the sensation of unraveling a conspiracy so you get messages or you get an email and a different and you sometimes you just had to wait like okay i sent a message there's nothing for me to do or to investigate uh, you know you can sit there and like study the website in detail and go over with a fine tooth comb looking for extra stuff but you know the big obvious clue you followed it you sent an email and you might not get a response until tomorrow hmm. and so it was made to be played in the background and everybody that played it said boy this sure is interesting but the game flopped hard. It was interesting, but I think it was interesting as a, it was more interesting to think about than to play. Ah, uh, yeah. And I wish I could remember. I like I don't even know what to search for. Like I don't even remember what the conspiracy was about. I'm gonna. I, I believe this was sometime in the mid to early aughts. So post X Files, maybe this would have been an alien conspiracy. But who knows? Big idea games. I mean, there's always Star Citizen. Oh my goodness, yeah. It hasn't flopped yet, though. I mean, technically, if this, if it were not overfunded by like, you know, 10,000% overfunded, it would have flopped years ago. But the fact that it is still bringing in money means we cannot call it a flop, even though it has not achieved its goals. Can and will. Um, there's another interesting MMO 
back in the day and I forget now. How did that work? I don't know. I'm not going to I'm not going to eat up all the show time trying to think of it. I'll put it in the show notes if it comes to me later. But that is interesting. Big idea flops. We don't see many of those. The age of experimentation was like, you know, technology got good enough that we could do more than just shoot demons around 2000. Yeah. But then games got kind of too expensive to get really experimental later that same decade. <laughs> like, so the, the age of experimentation wasn't that long. Well, at least of the the leading edge like big game studios, the, obviously there's a ton of experimentation going on in the indies now. Right. I mean, Minecraft was a big idea game, but that was not a flop. That was a massive success. Yeah. All right. Simulation to dear die. Okay. You want to read this one? Dear diecast, I am sure that Seamus and Paul are familiar with the popularized. Simulation hypothesis, a philosophical theory that would imply that we are statistically more likely to be living in a lifelike computer simulation rather than in the actual world. As a podcast website devoted to video game criticism, do you have any critical opinion regarding our simulated reality? Graphical fidelity, narrative issues and plot holes, bugs and glitches, romance options, etc. Or is our universe perhaps procedurally generated? Yours existentially, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Uh, this is the one that I avoided answering last week, but here we go. Yeah, I mean, I find this thing sort of annoying because it's not a real it's not a real scientific question. Like, oh, so what are the signs that it's a simulation? You know, wh what what makes you say it's a simulation? Because anything you, you know, anything can be explained away as well the simulation is really good or well the simulation is broken there. So you can fit this theory this theory can be made to fit any reality you find yourself in. You can always claim to be in a simulation. Mm. And you can't disprove it. It's Okay, this is the grown-ups version of um, when you're not looking, the world doesn't exist. Or <laughs> my cousin had the thing, you when you get on an elevator, it doesn't go up. People come out and rearrange all the furniture and walls real quick, and then the doors open again. That... <laughs> right that sort of um, theory where it doesn't strike me as being used. This is not useful. It doesn't tell me about the world. It doesn't tell me about my interactions with the world. I realize that there's this whole body of philosophy dedicated to stuff like this. And I, and I don't want to denigrate philosophy because philosophy is important, but I've never seen the point to this particular question. It doesn't tell me anything useful. It doesn't tell me how to exist in this reality any better. And really, if you're if you're at all religious like I am, then it just becomes a question of, well, how is God running the universe? <laughs> to, to what degree right, do we want right. to say that just, yeah, it was created yeah, I by think, an intelligence. I think both of us, yeah, both of us agree that the universe is in some way a simulation. Like it, it, isn't, it isn't the ultimate reality, right? There's an ultimate reality outside of this one. Uh, to which this one pertains, but this universe is not the end all of all things, right? There's, there's a reality that is higher than this. Right. And, but you can't observe that from here and you can't do anything about it. And well, I mean, I don't know how far we want to get into the weeds on this. Cause like, I, right. I have some thoughts that are like related to this, but they're all religious, like you said. So it's like, right. Yeah. Well, this this is, is the atheist. This is fascinating. Is, this is the atheist's version of can god make it things you know so big even he can't move it <laughs> you know it's like can you disprove something that can't be disproven or disprove something that hasn't been nailed down i'm gonna make it i'm gonna make a claim that has no concrete um properties and you can't disprove it and it's like well but how does that help either of us <laughs> yeah as far as criticizing all reality day. As if it were a video game, um, I I don't have any critiques on that level. Like I think I think God did a great job. Good job, God. Don't smite me. <laughs> uh, I mean, the cheeky answer would be to ask for better moderation. <laughs> yes, but who would be left, Seamus? Right. <laughs> The, the, that that request presumes that I'd be left, that I wouldn't be one of the band. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, I know. I know, right? It's it's tricky. It's very tricky. Let's move on. More solarium, maybe, and, and titanium seems overpowered. <laughs> Dear Diecast, what are game concepts you wish the industry would make more attempts at? Do you have any hopes that they would do so anytime soon? And why do you think it is we don't get games like Mass Effect or Jade Empire anymore? Kind regards, Andrew. Um, I wouldn't mind, yes, I wouldn't mind some more sci-fi, some, some more Trekian sci-fi, not just shooters set in space. We get lots of those, but I would like some sort of Trek space mystery. Mm. Um, I would also like more psychological horror. Psychological horror kind of went down the drain. It's um all the, like, we don't have any AAA horror games anymore except Resident Evil, which is turned into, like, weird B-movie action schlock comedy horror. No, and, I mean, don't forget No Man's Sky. <laughs> the horror of realizing your pockets are full again. Um, yeah, so, but, like, there are psychological horror games, but they're all indie, like, walk around the spooky farm, <laughs> the the maze of jump scares. You know, there we don't get Silent yeah. Hill anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't get, like, a story-driven a character, something to overcome, some existential horror, you know, some what adversity was the, to overcome. There was one that came out recently with your, like, a postman or something. What was that? Was it Hideo Kojima? Oh yeah, uh, Death Stranding. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, was, was that was that considered I horror? Know. I never I, played I, it. I saw it, and it. I mean, like, it looked like comedy to me. Seeming seeing Norman Reedus <laughs> run with like a refrigerator on his back was always super hilarious to me. Maybe there were horrific elements in it that just never made it into the highlight reels. Um. Yeah. The fridge so is full of thing. copies of the Star Wars Christmas special. <laughs> um, so more horror, more Trek sci-fi a la Mass Effect 1. There are no sequels. Right. And more horror that is psychological rather than um, violence, but, you know, just action violence. Like, I don't, I mean, I like chopping off zombie heads as much as anybody. You know, I really love Left 4 Dead, but that doesn't that doesn't instill the feeling of dread in me, which I really enjoy, is a game that can actually make me dread opening the door. Um, mm. You know, and when I, you, I never feel that in Dead Space. I'm like, well, I've got this, like, buzzsaw gun, and I know what's on the other side of the door, so let, <laughs> I kick open the door, let's go for it. Oh, yeah. no, it's more of the same monster that I've killed 3,000 of. How will I ever... Oh, they're fucking dead. Oh, well. <laughs> right, or, or like Bloodborne or something. It's all like right. body horror kind of models, but like the mechanics are, are more empowerment, skill-based execution. So it's it's not like you're you're dreading playing the game. You're just like, oh, there's some dreadful things in the game. Right. And so I would I would love to see that again. Some stuff along the lines of Thief. I used I used to love how Thief would sort of like present normal stealth tension and then once or twice a game throw you into a totally unexpected. All of a sudden, whoa, it's, you know, psychological horror. That was really effective. Mm. And you had no, and it was, you hide from the monsters and you have good, Stealth mechanics to go with that. Uh, stealth mechanics are hard. Indian indies don't want to mess with that. It's very hard because yeah, that's true. It's good stealth mechanics is really an exercise in AI. Having an AI, and not only good that, AI, but like AI that's understandably good in a way that you can see what they're going to do and, right. and how to how to avoid them. Right, AI that's real good, but you can't tell why it stopped looking for you or you know it feels like oh it almost got to me and then it just stopped looking was that just the game decided it didn't want to kill me or is... yeah it feels arbitrary yeah and uh so you need uh what was it chris franklin called it perceivable consequence um mm. thief had the light gem where you could see how visible you were so there's your perceivable consequence the gem is dark therefore i am incredibly hard to see and the bad guys won't 
see me unless they bump into me. But I can't stay here in this dark shadow. I must have crossed this pool of light somehow or find a way around. And I have to keep my wits about me because the bad guys are moving around. And I have no means to defeat them traditionally. All I have is means to escape and, and delay and hide again. Those are dynamite yeah, mechanics. And, yeah, and it yeah. sets up, it sets the ground for horror because you're in the mindset of don't be found, don't get caught, make sure that you know you have an escape route at all times. Right, and the the way that it would only do that a couple times a game. Like imagine if the game started off like that, like oh I'm a guy who goes into spooky tombs. That's my job. That feels a little like. Okay, well, here's my very first dungeon, and there's my very first skeleton, and it becomes old hat. You can't maintain intensity for that long. Well, the, if, the, yeah, the, if you're doing Tomb Raider, then, like, it's Tomb Raider, but if you want, right. like, the horror of a, a tomb with undead in it, then it, that can't be your day job, right? Right. Like, if, if he does it all the time, then this is blasé for him. It's not a big deal for him. You would not do, you do not go in for horrific, you know, life-changing experiences on a daily basis. <laughs> that is not your day job. Right, right. Is, so you have to assume that the main character is okay with this. So if I freak out, you know, my, my goal is to get in sync with my character who just shrugs and sits in the corner and waits for the skeleton to go by so he can get into the tomb. But in a game where you're, a robber that is thrust into this dangerous oh i can't get out the normal way oops i have to go out this way oh no i have to go out through the haunted mausoleum hedge maze thing now i'm trapped in this horrible situation that's much more interesting i love it yeah. i love it i wish yeah. we could we'd do more of it it'd be interesting if someone attempted like a, a metroidvania kind of stealth game where you start off with very few options for stealth and then you gradually get more and more and you keep traversing the same area, but it has new options for traversal and, and new kind of challenges all the time. You, you really learn the level really well. Yeah, like Garrett, Garrett in the Thief games starts with uh, water arrows to put out torches, but if you didn't start with that and there was just no way to approach this door because of the bright light, right, and then later right. you get a way to extinguish that light, that would be interesting. Yeah, and then you would have to worry about, okay, well, I can go through that door, but what's behind it now? Yeah, uh, you would right. also have to, you would also have to come up with different monsters if it's just well, skeletons. Everywhere. If it was, yeah, if it was procedurally generated, Seamus, then you could go through the door and you know you die or whatever, and like that's your run. You know, you can make it like a roguelike where now there's a whole new setup and like maybe a different thing is behind the door now. So. You'll never know what would have happened if you'd gone through. And uh, right. the, the stakes are higher there, too. Yeah. So before we wrap this up, do you have anything you wish that uh, we would do? That would no, just back? procedural generation in general. I love it. I love procedural yeah. content. It's so cool. Yeah. I, I, I wish they had, you too. know, done that more. I, I wish that there wasn't the, all these sinks for procedural content where, like, oh, but, you know, this game tried it and it was terrible. So we're not going to do procedural generation anymore. Thanks a lot. No Man's Sky. Right? <laughs> the The narrative is that No Man's Sky has been redeemed. Like, if you look on most games criticism websites, people say, oh, the game's been redeemed. And I disagree. It's be <laughs> it is much better than it was at launch, but that isn't the same as being redeemed. Yeah. Oh, well. Door Ford is coming to Steam, and, you know, that's that's what we can hope for now. Oh, yeah. I just looked at that in my wish list, and uh, that's been in my wish list for years now, with the release date <laughs> of time is subjective. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see, Dwarf Fortress. We'll see. All right. Those were some great questions. Thank you, everybody, to send, who sent in questions this week. If you've got a... We've got lots left, but if you've got a question for the show... Our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Uh, back to the Galactic Academy for me.